Yo what is up my friends welcome to another episode of those cast my name is Vinamr Kasana if you are new to our youtube channel please subscribe because we release new episodes every tuesday and friday at 12 pm indian standard time if you are listening to this podcast on an audio platform make sure you give us five stars because we're the best in bharat today's guest is kamlesh d patel also known as daji the man who is responsible for heading the heartfulness foundation for teaching the heartfulness meditation practice to the world and uh, for essentially being a modern day meditator who is actually pretty accessible to talk to i had an hour long conversation with him in hyderabad where the heartfulness headquarters is located we talked about his new book the wisdom bridge more importantly i think i asked some hard questions of daji because i have been i like meditating but i've been skeptical of certain things about how meditation can heal the world so i asked him things like how you can figure out ptsd with meditation what to do when you look inside your heart and you find nothing beyond hatred malice and evil and can a criminal essentially live a better life using meditation this these were some of the questions i asked daji you can find more of what i just talked about in this amazing conversation i had with daji the episode with daji begins in 3 2 1 hi daji uh thank you so much for making the time to speak with me uh i've been spending the last day uh immersing myself in this beautiful place i even uh had a brush with learning whatever i could of the heartfulness technique I had a headache which is gone now. Um I just wanted to I've never done something like this before. I haven't spoken to I haven't spoken to someone of uh of all the things that you do. I've never done that before. I read your book um and I wanted to ask a, a rather strange question. You know in your meditation technique uh people are often asked to think of like a nice divine light. in the heart right um i found that when when i look into my heart or someone might look into their heart it's not always divine you know like you can when people look into their hearts they will often find malice evil prejudice all of that and get distracted so what would you say to those people well collect the best thing that has happened to you in your life love for example right and when we are pursuing meditation with a purpose to become divine ourselves and to me divinity or godliness is all about love in almost all religion when why almost or rather all religions believe god is love right and experiencing that love within our heart is akin to experiencing god and immersing ourselves in that love filled ocean and it's it's very enchanting and very joyful recollect those moments where you were loved or you loved someone so much and bring those uh, positive vibrations in your heart and get soaked in it get immersed in it with it and see where it takes you some fragrance of love should be there in the heart you can say the same for even people who have experienced no love have had traumatic childhoods have had problems with the nurturers that they had in their life i think they can better be attracted in a, in a in a very nice way actually since they have the negative experience and something they are always looking forward to cuz they you know one who is given a good feeding of love they don't miss it so much it's there at least the person who has gone to trauma will have the inkling the sensation the awareness of what is absent so something they can look forward to hungry man is not unaware of bread traumatic man is not unaware of love at least he can dream of love in meditation and that can take us somewhere yeah so your book the wisdom bridge which came out recently uh as someone who's not a parent um i i had a difficult time understanding some of the things that were written for a parent but i figured you know i would instead look at my childhood and compare that to your childhood and you mentioned you grew up like in a village in gujarat where you were able to run free uh you had all the freedom in the world and you were raised by essentially an entire village which is like a more tribal kind of 
uh, upbringing different than the kind of upbringing that people have now in nuclear families, where either they're raised by their parents or by their maids or by whoever's available. Sorry? The surroundings. The surroundings, right? And one of the lines that really struck out to me was you said, back then it was not important to make children feel special, but to make them feel secure, right? And if you read any of the articles today, if you read about the helicopter parenting in China, or you read about how in certain famous schools in India, parents have access to CCTV footage of their kids so that they can, quote unquote, see what they're doing at all times. Mm -hmm. It's very, very different from the kind of world that you grew up in. Why do you think making children feel special is a problem? It's not so much about not making them feel special. I think making them feel special often drains parents. Your energies are invested in a wrong track. You are investing your funds, your limited resources into things which you should not be really bothered about. So if you don't have a trust in a school, why let your child be going to visiting that school at all? If you don't have trust, how are you inculcating trust in your child? So I saw you doing this, I saw you were playing this, I saw you were crying, baby, what was wrong with you today? Watching, 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 and imagine what happens to the child later on. Papa is watching, Papa is watching, Papa is watching. Everybody is watching me. They can't express themselves freely. And any time you are not able to express yourself freely, you know, you feel bound and your inner creativity will be lost. Yeah. It, because it is through mistakes we learn many things. And you begin rebelling in strange ways. You become passive aggressive to the people who care for you. Mm -hmm. And you try to find ways to get out. Yeah. But how do you think parents can strike that balance? Because it's, 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 it's not the same. It's not the same. You know, many people, they do keep a camera inside the house, right? Oh, this is my, is my babysitter taking care of my baby properly. There's plus and minus to it. At that age, you do require it. Because you don't know whom you are entrusting your child with. In the school, it's a different story. There are many, many children playing around, many teachers looking after them. So I, I think seeing watching everything and telling your children what you are doing, what you are seeing, is different from having a, a technology inside your bedroom or in your living room watching. Because you are not interacting with a toddler. You are not interacting, speaking to a two months old. How was your maid? Oh, I saw you crying. Did you cry? Why were you crying? These questions are not there. In fact, you are taking action directly uh, in a reciprocal way with the attendee or the caretaker. Such is not the case in the school. So you are only satisfying yourself. Oh, I saw my child and I saw he's doing very well. That's all. What more are you doing? I want to take a slightly different tangent from the book because there is there is context that needs to be set. I'm, I saw you for the first time last night and I'm seeing you again today. Uh, I was briefly introduced to Heartfulness through my friend Aman who's in the room. Um, and I was reading a story and your father was roughly a Vedic doctor, administered medicines of various kinds and I saw some of the things you spoke to the villagers from Madhya Pradesh today. If I were to even hazard a guess, what led us here? What led you to essentially build all of this wonderful, this semi-big city <laughs> and, and find yourself in India teaching meditation? Did you, did you always feel like you were destined for this life? No, not at all. Not even <laughs> in 2010 or 9, no, not at all. But I did have some inkling sometime when I was 25, 26 for a brief period that I am here 
to create a spiritual legacy. That sense was there. But then later on, after graduation and marriage, etc., that sense was gone, that, uh, that inkling that I'm here to create a spiritual empire was totally gone, forgotten. It's like beaten up by the circumstances. <laughs> Worldly responsibilities. Yeah. And uh, nevertheless, I carried on with my individual spiritual practice uh, in, during college and then after the pharmacy college went abroad, worked, raised a family. And also, like many trainers in Sahaj Mark or Heartfulness Way of System, served uh, whoever came home for meditation sessions. This was in New York? This was in New York. And what uh, part of New York did you stay in? Well, uh, first I was in New Jersey in Weehawken, then later on in Brooklyn, then I moved and settled permanently in Staten Island. Mm -hmm. Bought a house there and I used to commute between Staten Island and New York City for business. Yeah. There, there was a spiritual flavor to my entire life, which is, but the idea that to create empire was never present after those initial uh, days of my practice. Then it got somehow subsided. And some, and my master himself was announcing that I'll be the successor. Uh, it, it created goosebumps and I started crying from within. Uh, this is it. <laughs> and uh, that changed the life altogether, not in uh, inner life, but externally. The responsibility of running uh, such an international organization spread over 165 countries, following each country's rules, uh, you know, which are so different. For example, the spiritual societies in India versus spiritual societies in United Arab Emirates versus Saudi Arabia versus Iran versus Jerusalem versus Switzerland, US, it's all so different. And it does take away your time right, and your attention also. Our main work is spiritual through transmission. For example, if someone would like to practice the system, they can practice remotely also. They don't have to go to Guru's place or Receptor's place. You can meditate in the comfort of your own home. And that's what I like about the whole system, that you are yourself at the same time, whenever you like to have the company of like-minded individuals with whom you can meditate comfortably, is also, it, it's developing. Uh, but to answer you, no, I don't even know what will happen tomorrow. So it's difficult to say, did I plan for this 10 years back? No, not even one year back. <laughs> when your spiritual responsibilities increased, when you were quote unquote named the successor, successor of the Heartfulness Way, did it come at cross purposes with your business acumen, with your businesses, with the desire to make money, uh, buy property, expand your business? <laughs> Well, that didn't come in my way. In Somehow in 2003, right, I had this feeling, okay, this, now it's enough. What do business I'm doing henceforth is for joy, for fun, for, you know. Uh, it became pressureless thing. It, just, it, it was an autopilot kind of a thing. Family life was, I mean, has always been successful. God has been very gracious, even in the business world. Very little effort and much more has been received. So as far as material life is concerned, because of the spiritual effect into it, I had no tension whatsoever in the business world. Um, in fact, there's in spirituality also, I never bothered, uh, worry. I practiced what was prescribed and I followed it like a clock. And, uh, I never felt any deficiency of anything in life. Be it money or be it a spiritual state, people crave for what is for. The biggest thing people crave for is peace and contentment. I had it just like that. It was, I mean, it's not a 
something that you try. It just happens to you because as a result of your practice. But then how, how does the meditation practice work in sync with someone who still has a lot of ambitions and desires? Because I find that other practices, for example, <clears throat> the most serious practitioners often ask people who are earlier on the way to let go of certain things and, and almost demand a degree of asceticism mm. or a degree of letting go. In fact, even now, I've done the Vipassana technique briefly about three years ago and I meditate as and when I can. Even now, it's almost like meditating will let me let go of some things that I don't want to let go of mm. or doing that will make me still where I should be running and making things happen. The Guru's responsibility is to create a state in Sishya in such a way that his life becomes easier. Uh, if you have to fly, for example, you don't need to instruct, prop your car, it just happens. In order to move into a higher level of consciousness, do you drop lower level of consciousness? No, you are simply attracted towards the higher. Lower automatically drops off. So the true spiritual maturity as it develops, less matured, uh, it's like a tree shedding the bark or shedding the leaves and bringing new leaves. Exactly something like that happens with the spiritual growth. Unnecessary thing drops up on their own. Then you later on realize, oh, it's gone. Who's a spiritual speaker or a philosopher that you grew up admiring? Vivekananda. Vivekananda? Why, why, why him say over someone else? He was bold and courageous. Yeah. Very practical. He, everything that he did from his early childhood to rebellious youth, and what we call today the rebellious youth is just nothing when compared to rebellion, rebellious attitude Vivekananda had. But he was tamed nicely by his Guru Ramakrishna Paramahansa. So, becoming a Vivekananda goes to the credit of Ram Krishna Paramahansa, and that's what we need. Person of that caliber who says, "Don't drop anything. I'll make you." Do you drop poverty when you become rich? No, I think you are. You still remember where you came from. That's it. Except for memory, nothing remains. You don't actually <laughs> drop anything with efforts. It just happens naturally. I remember a story about Vivekananda that I read in a book when I was visiting Goa a few years ago, how he was giving a lecture in America. Mm. And uh, like, like you said, he was known for his boldness. So one man in America tried to provoke him by shooting a gun at him or like shooting a gun right next to him. And he, he stood there unfazed, which I thought was pretty wonderful. But I. Uh, I haven't heard much about him as such after that. His, his lessons have not been as well uh, received or have, he hasn't had a big audience in my generation now. Maybe, you know, I don't know why, but that's the only story I know about him. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, that was just my, uh, that was just the only thing I knew about Vivekananda, so I figured I'd bring it up. I had another question about you sitting and giving answers and you giving, um, like you gave, gave a discourse for an hour. Just the responsibility of being, if I may use the word, spiritual preacher, does that become heavy? Do you ever feel like at certain points you don't know the answers? Do you feel like because your role demands you to essentially lead people in their spiritual lives that you must always know what to say? <laughs> no, I never felt inadequate. I have any task, mundane or otherwise, spiritual or 
and never felt inadequate that sense, in that sense. That confidence is always there. I may not have words, but through meditation we can derive a condition that answers all your questions. If you ask me, can you describe God? I'll be speechless. But if through meditation we can experience. So, <clears throat> we don't shut up the questioner, but the questioner goes satisfied. Whatever little experience they can have, and say, yes, there is something. When you were in, when you were in America, I've been to New York a bunch of times. Uh, the city is electric, filled with a kind of frenzy that makes people feel like they can accomplish anything. Mm. There's a famous Ali Shaki song, uh, Welcome to New York, this is where dreams are made of. Uh, did that somehow help you better as a businessman or kind of even as a spiritual guru make you understand what not to do? Because New York is full of insane success and absolute abject poverty and homelessness. Yes. Like, how do you think those years in New York have shaped you? Because it is, it is really unique. For example, if I were to use Osho, Osho spent most of his life in India and then went to Oregon and, and then came back and he saw America and that, that those years in America influenced him later on in his, uh, you know, in his preachings as well. It strengthened me actually. Yes. It strengthened you? Strengthened. Strengthen you, okay. Because yes. <clears throat> there are a lot of opposites and there are many temptations. I worked for more than a year passing. <clears throat> I worked in Harlem, for example, and each time I had to pass to 42nd Street. And 42nd Street of 1983 and 84, I mean, it, <laughs> it should no, not shootings. It's all more of a pleasure street. <laughs> uh, pleasure street. In exactly what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Every store was displaying something uh, exquisite, one better than the other. And to pass through and go from Port Authority bus station to Times Square to catch a train, it challenges you. Should I, should I not, should I, should I not. That strengthens you. I think when we are moving in a very conducive environment, some, at a certain uh, level of maturity, conducive environment is good. For example, a rich man's son. Right? The wealth can be utilized properly if the child is mature enough. But the same wealth can go against, even though there is so much, it will serve as a downhill uh, devolution of a child. For a conscientious person, having these challenges make them, that soul will become stronger. And when they come, enter into a very conducive environment, like this spiritual environment, they flourish. But one must be challenged. Without challenge, you cannot have moral or mental or physical strength developed. So you when you say challenge, what do you mean? For what example, kind of you know, we love to go to the gym, right? Build muscles and six packs. and. <laughs> It's a nice thing to do, because you are looking after your body. And when we are challenged at a mental level, we develop our mind, capacity of the mind. When we are challenged at emotional level, either you become great or you become a slave. Emotions are like that. Either you go into depression or if you surpass it, you become stronger. Spirituality is also like that. Its challenge is always necessary at a moral level, so that if you win, it's such a great pleasure. If you lose, you develop guilt. 
how can people incorporate this kind of challenge that you describe in their daily lives? Because when I, you were giving the discourse today, I had a hard time sitting still um, after the meditation. I was fidgeting all around. And I figured, you know, if I go home, I'll do five, 10 minutes, no more, because I don't want to sit uncomfortably and meditate for so long. Well, start with five minutes. What all you can, it's better than nothing. And in fact, it's, uh, it's a quite an experience. <clears throat> Let us see when you start all this recording. Do this experiment. In future, whenever you begin this recording, all the cameraman and the interview, interviewer that is yourself and the people you interview, let them sit for calm, with calm mind, calm heart, closed eyes for two, three minutes and then take on the work and see what happens. Same thing can be done in corporate meetings. 12 o'clock the meeting is going to start. It's all right. Everybody is assembled. Close your eyes for two, three minutes and reflect at least on the agenda of the meetings. You know, in corporate world, many a times you are there. And you don't know. You have forgotten why you are there. No. Only when somebody starts <coughs> speaking, then you can recollect, oh, this is why we are here. When you reflect on the topic of agenda, you are able to contribute with a good awareness of your mind. Otherwise, you are like shooting in the dark. You don't know whom you are shooting. That's actually the daily life of a lot of us in my generation because, uh, say for some of the other recordings or any other meetings, I remember if the meeting is at 1 p.m. till 12.59, I'm going to be scrolling on my phone and it's going to be the same for everyone else involved. And maybe it's different for you because you grew up at a time when I'm sure there were temptations of roughly the same magnitude, but in a different way. Now, more than ever, it's harder to focus. And for some of us who actively work in the media space, it almost makes sense to consume so much to understand what is going on so that we can leverage it to our advantage. But at the same time, I don't see that I feel better after doing that. But, you know, it's my job. I kind of have to do that. So how do we cultivate focus among all these temptations and desires, screens, phones, you know, um, entertainment, all of that? You heard the term hijacking of mind? I have heard of the term hijacking, yeah. Hijacking the heart, hijacking the feelings. That's what screen time does to us. Recently, I had problems. My grandchild is just completed two years in December, mm -hmm. on uh, 23rd December. <clears throat> Each time he came in my lap, it, da, da, I want to see Coco Melon. So we were both hooked on Coco Melons. <laughs> and then we decided one day, no more Coco Melon. Collectively? Was it you yeah. or was it him? What is that to that? Mother and myself, his mother, and especially more from her side. And uh, two days we had trouble. But after that, he started engaging himself in a little cart and you know different things. And many people uh, came to rescue. And after two days of this, uh, no screen time, no TV time. He got diverted into other creative things. And then last week, the change I see is simply amazing. His creativity and the word, you know, little children, they speak words. That can amaze you how in the world, where did he pick it up from? Right? Manners, uh, composer, everything changed just after dropping this uh, cocoa melon business. Somehow, when you are watching, it may be a great article, it may be a great drama, doesn't matter. But somehow your mind is carried by someone else. And for that period, your creativity is lost. Mm -hmm. 
that means you are not thinking on your own you are always giving examples from the movie you are sharing stories from the movies sharing stories from the cartoons sharing stories from the messages you receive sharing stories from the news you read what is your part what do you have to say about it about nothing actually problem comes when you say oh what do you say about the comments made by so and so why am i bothered with it and yeah, you can just have no opinion how is it your business mind your business when i am practicing as a doctor it's okay to gain so much of knowledge and information let's use it for with a purpose for creativity for enhancing uh, knowledge so that you can serve better right what uh, taliban did or what uh, mr putin did or who so why are you bothered about it no it doesn't actually affect your civic life mm-hmm. even cricket for example i'm going to irritate a lot of people perhaps that's a national pastime uh-huh. that also has affects your mind and the worst is golfers two idiots or three idiots are playing over the ball and millions are watching yeah but me people would argue it's very difficult to just then sit still if you well immerse yourself in something creative play yourself you know instead of seeing other golfer playing out you play golf yourself mm. play the cricket yourself and see how it pressures your blood how it exercises your body it doesn't matter you may be able to hit six or not you may not be able to uh, spin a ball but still play i'm not against cricket as long as you yourself are playing right it's very different uh, to immerse yourself in one activity than to passively consume someone else doing that uh, that's where we get hijacked and lose our abilities mm-hmm. we'll take a different tangent here you are actively involved in your grandchildren's life which is wonderful uh, and now in the book you mentioned that you know in the earlier days there would be a generation gap but generations generally had a few pastimes that they could do together and bond around mm-hmm. then you said that now what you have is a generational chasm where it's so wide and the elders of the seniors feel like a lack of confidence to allow kids into their lives and vice versa when i was reading that i couldn't help but think i used to be a lot closer to my um, grandmother when i was a kid mm. and now i just don't know what to talk about and i'm sure this is the case for many people like the idea of warm doting grandparents no matter how warm they are um is just going missing now because it seems like oh they might just talk about their own fears they might not understand where i'm coming from and that chasm deepens and i figured how can someone essentially strengthen and repair the relationship with the elders in their family especially when there's a degree of arrogance or hubris in 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 say someone who's younger who feels like mm, i don't know what my grandparents really have to offer i'm just being super honest it's all right do you really want to i say when you want to understand a person really badly oh what is the need of my so and so my grandma or grandfather or father or my younger sister do you really want to do it then the solution will come but you are so self obsessed then there is a problem um, then this guilt sets in and there is no cure for guilt you know often people you know they come to me <coughs> after when the year one passes on to to the here after oh you know i can't forgive myself i could have done this for my wife 
I could have done this for my father, I could have done this for my mother. I could have said sorry when there was a time, now I can't say sorry. Can I convey my sorry to my, you know, my wife? I said, what, how will that serve the purpose? It's too late in the game. <clears throat> so whatsoever we have to do now, we have to realize, let's do it now. When, whenever, whenever we get a chance to serve someone, do it with all your heart. And if you don't have this opening of the heart, pray to God, sorry, I'm not able to do it. Mm. And see what happens next. How he plays out his own games and create circumstances like existence, you know, they, it somehow surprises us by the unknown factors it brings together and fulfills our wish. We as uh, youngsters may not realize the need, oh, what do I do with my grandfather, grandmother? I, it's okay. But even when, <coughs> by chance, if you get a feeling in your heart, even for a second, that let me do something, say hello to my grandmother, and see the smile, see the happiness, see showers all around. And we have to open her, open them up, because they also feel, oh, why should I disturb my children, my yeah, grandchildren, they also feel like that. And we remain, un the, the, we both remain unspoken from both sides. Someone has to take up that challenge and break the ice and say, okay, share us your story. I think one of the reasons why people don't take up responsibility, especially younger people don't take up responsibility to mend their family unit is because they're afraid of the responsibility that comes with it. Because... <laughs> you can't run away from it either. Yeah, what I mean by that is, you do a nice thing for someone and you do a nice thing for your parents and your grandparents and you ritualize ritualize meeting for lunch every week and you don't realize that that compounds sometimes that stands against your detached free spirit wandering nature and as a result you can just say in the middle fuck it I don't want to do it anymore mm -hmm. and all of that crumbles on the other hand um, parents and grandparents do a much better job and you almost wish you were like them, but you realize, mm, I don't have to. But I always wonder, if we as young people did it, we could actually provide a lot more to the family unit than our parents and grandparents, because we have youth energy and uh, make them feel secure in their lives when, when they start feeling scared, or when mortality is near, for example. Tenderness. What we are missing today is tenderness, tender hearts, tender touch. Youth has become very aggressive mentally, physically, emotionally. And we should not be selective about whom shall I be tender, my mother, my father, my girlfriend, my boyfriend, my neighbor, no. to everything, even to pick up a glass. Pick it up with a lot of tenderness. Drink it water with tenderness, softness. But do you not think tenderness is punished harshly in society? That it's almost like there is you're too nothing, tender, you take there, is, of you. there is nothing strong, no stronger force than tenderness. Subtle force. Think of ice and water. Water melts and breaks the rocks, boulders, little by little, little by little. Time it takes, but it works 100%. Someone can break your heart, it's all right. You are very tender towards her, perhaps. But whose fault it is? 
when the heart is broken the heart of a tender person will never be broken because the heart itself is so tender nothing can break it only when it is rocky it gets broken or you see people who still have a difficult time trusting and specifically if i were to sort of recontextualize my question it's great to be tender when you are older it's great to be tender when you are like a mother teresa as figure but maybe for young men it's perhaps best serve to be a little bit cutthroat to to get what you want and protect what is your own because i've often found in my own limited experience of life that tenderness is often taken advantage of that if you are nice and loving to everyone it's often confused as being naive and people walk all over you particularly in the world of business i have also done business for more than 30 years in pharmacy business i didn't see any disadvantage of being tender many a times there will be patients who would come up and say oh doc i would like to take so much of medicine but i don't have money to pay and this is a stranger coming to you and made the bill rises to about 2300 dollars right most people pay some will not pay okay girlfriends boyfriends oh i loved that man so much he ditched me then she complains again after 2 years so i gave all my heart i did everything i could he just now time has come i close my heart whom are you punishing if the river starts thinking i stop flowing so that i don't get invested into all these things around surrounding me then she will never reach the ocean i don't want to flow i will not let my love flow from my heart people might take advantage of then your flow the flow of love will be stagnated you become hard the other is not going to suffer <laughs> you will suffer so trust is not for the sake of others trust is sick is for the sake of myself i preserve myself but how do you reverse a lifetime of jadedness it's okay they don't care people of tender hearts and trusting attitude they don't worry about it they are higher on a pedestal okay let it be let it be you are richer you have nothing to lose they have lost you the company of a wise person or the company of a holy person whom they could have trusted but they could not that is their failure <clears throat> let me ask you something else about uncomfortable feelings you know earlier i mentioned that hey when i look into my heart i don't see a divine light i see all kinds of malice and prejudice and all of that uh in jungian psychology for example carl jung talks about how uh there is a necessity for honoring some of these feelings because they show you a part of you that you often repress to be nice to people so that you can be, keep believing that you're a good person but then when you look at your quote unquote shadow you see that you know there is malice and evil and all of that uh do you think a lifetime of meditation can eventually do away with these feelings and do you yourself find yourself having these feelings and when, when they come up what do you do okay meditation in itself cannot do it meditation in fact 
if you are a thief, can make you a better thief. If you have murderous tendencies, you can become a great murderer. No one can catch you. You heard the term premeditated murder? Yes. <laughs> so you see how premeditated murder is so complex. Meditative mind can create a lot of complexities. So only meditation is not going to solve the problem. Uh, meditative mind becomes very sharp. Knife, sharp knife, can cut vegetables at the same time if it has knowing tendencies, known in itself, consciousness in knife, to do wicked things. You can't stop it either. It depends on the person who handles that knife. One who handles the mind, meditative mind, should I use this for positive things or the negative things? <clears throat> when I have Porsche, 300, 500 horsepower, right? And meditation gives you so much of power, 500 horsepower, great. But what if it is stuck in mud? You can't ride it. Stuck, being stuck in the mud means you are stuck with your intentions, bad intentions. You are stuck with bad qualities in you. You have compromised yourself so much that you have created a muddy life inside you. So filthy. A meditative mind, if rightly guided, can clean all these tendencies. Little by little, little by little, and purify the mind. Pure mind cannot conceive of murder, cannot conceive of hate, cannot conceive of prejudice. But it does take practice, right? Yeah. So we have to practice both meditation, at the same time, some method that can purify ourselves. And that we do teach in a heartfulness way, in the evening, uh, we try to get rid of all the negative that we have collected during their time. Right? Like he was giving you the example of 42nd Street. I go to work, passing 42nd Street, coming back home, 42nd Street again, looking all those naked girls in the hanging in the windows, doing all those rope dances. Do you think you get, you remain unaffected by all those? No. It will affect your psyche so much. So I used to use this method of cleaning. But all complexities and impurities that has been accumulated in my mind are going away from my system. And I would sit with this uh, determination and I would purify myself. And then later on, after a few encounters like that. You don't bother with it. It's okay. They are doing their job. You're doing your job. Yeah, that's particularly true for New York because you encounter so many weird people that after a while, if you live there long enough, you just walk right past them. Oh. <clears throat> you uh, also mentioned epigenetics in your book and environment and in general, how people, where they're born, what their mother's emotional state is, how that influences who they eventually become. If someone lives in a slum currently, or they live in a harsh circumstance, and they really can't get out of their environment, what can they do to make sure that they remain pure? Because I don't think people usually um, give importance to where they live. Um, and they don't, even, they don't even, for example, they just get used to, you know, like there's this famous uh, line, uh, I forget the author's name, uh, where, he, where a big fish goes to two small fish uh, and he's like, hey guys, how's the water? They're like, what water? Because they don't know. <laughs> that is so true. You have it's a tough, tough situation actually where you don't know. You have been conditioned by your environment so much. 
you don't know what the other side looks like. And if at all you look at the other side, you look at it with envy, hatred, anger, then there is very little one can do. See? The example that I gave in this book about this mothers living in ghettos, the example is from the book Biology of Belief by Dr. Lipton. Bruce Lipton, right? Bruce Lipton, yeah. right. And he, he, he did a wonderful study on mothers to, to be, mothers to be, who were living in ghetto, tough neighborhood, a lot of violence, where husband comes home and keeps the gun under his pillow and goes to sleep. Mother is always waiting, you know, mother to be, and uh, the kind of emotions he goes through. Right? And when she is pregnant, and with those thoughts in mind, when he's going to come, how it will be like, and sometimes he gets punched around also. <clears throat> so the sympathetic nervous system is always on the go, always active. And when that happens, the stress hormones are injected, I mean, released into your stream, goes into your bloodstream, and it crosses your placenta barrier and enters the embryo. Embryo has nothing to do with the external environment, yet gets affected because of mother's blood system. Now what happens because of the sympathetic response? The blood circulation will be more in the limbs at the cost of visceral organ. Blood will flow more in the arms and legs. It is diverted from frontal brain. Right. Right? Then uh, lungs, spleen, liver, digestive system, uh, your reproductive organs. So, uh, blood, when it is diverted, the other visceral organs, they get less of it. So, imagine when such is the case with embryo, receiving less blood in the frontal cortex, for example. One example we take. Uh, the less blood supply in the frontal cortex means less development of the frontal brain. So they don't develop a good thinking ability when they mature. So it's the biggest problem. Also because it is moving away from the GI tract, digestive problems also are inherited somehow in there because of the situation in life. The environment thus impacts the fetus inside and changes the biology. Per contrast, you know, children being brought up in a healthier environment, they'll have a very well developed frontal cortex, well adjusted system. And that is also the impact of the environment. It's a tragedy that, you know, in, in slums and ghettos where people, children are, you know, have to grow, it's very unfortunate. How to get out of that situation is very, 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 very difficult. The scars will always be there. We cannot undo it. Uh, even beyond slums and ghettos, people who are just perpetually used to being in fight or flight because they, or freeze for that matter, for, because they saw like a harsh upbringing. They might have been born in a very rich household, but for them, perhaps it's easier to do that through, through meditation. Because when you talked about the sympathetic nervous system, I have friends whose shoulders are always uh, lurched up like this all the time in panic and anxiety, <laughs> right? And they have to be tough. Mm -hmm. uh, this is particularly true for like a generation previous than mine, for men who, who they weren't sure where the next meal was coming from. So they had to like, quote unquote, uh, develop their claws, get their fangs out, be tough. But it's like the hardest thing is to tell the soldiers that the war was long over, but they still live in like a perpetual state of war, you know? and. I think so many people in our country have undiagnosed PTSD from things they don't even know about. Mm. Um, and I have spoken to some people who have that, 
and they hate meditating because they're reminded. Um, yes. Mindfulness practices where you become more and more aware, it works against you. You become more aware of PTSD. You become more aware of so many other things. So that's why I say meditative, the meditation that brings about awareness alone is not good. Hmm. One has to get rid of all the unnecessary garbage. The cause behind PTSD, causes that triggered all these diseases, mental problems, emotional problems. We are the product, we are the results of some causes. Cause could be yourself or someone else, it really doesn't matter. Cause is there. How to reduce the impact of the cause and thus reducing the impact on our life. That requires again a combined effort by so many individuals. I give you an example from Ramayana, Lord Rama. <coughs> He being the incarnate uh, incarnation of God, he naturally didn't have any samskar or the cause, causal uh, seeds that can give you such a life. His life was full of miseries actually. Yeah, horrible life. Horrible life, right? <clears throat> Why did it happen? If you consider as karma, he didn't have any previous karmas to start with because he was newly born soul as an avatar. But what changed the course of his life? His life was influenced by unreasonable mother. She didn't have clear thinking nor right understanding. Kai kai. She influenced the life and destroyed entire clan. Father died in the process. He had to go to jungle with his wife and a brother. Bharat kept on lamenting every I mean, the entire palace was became dark. Just by how one person can influence the destiny of so many. So it is not just what is in my action, what is in my karma, but others can also influence my destiny. Yeah. And then, just a addition to that, I, for some reason, uh, when I was young, I read this, I just saw this book title that said, Why Do Good People Suffer? Mm. And a few people I know were reading it, so I laughed because I was like, oh, they think they're good people. You know? um, and th there's only a few people I know in my life who've had a hard life and they, uh, have lived it honorably nonetheless. I find that people who think that they're good and are nice, the moment something bad happens, they start complaining and start lamenting their destiny. Like, why does it happen to me? I do charity twice a day, you know, so on and so forth. I mean, is that karma for them? or uh, His expectation runs so high. Their expect like why love marriages fail? It's like that only, you see. Your expectations are so high and when little bit is also not met, you rebel. Oh, God is supposed to do this for me. I am just giving 10 rupees to this fellow, 1000 rupees to this fellow. I threw about 10 grams every day in the temple, my gold, and yet I suffer. Who told you to do all this anyway? You could have fed someone or you could uh, stop fighting with your driver or your maid and make them richer. It is not that the good people suffer and bad people enjoy. Deep down you have not understood what is suffering and what is enjoyment. Have you seen the life of any of these crooked people? Always apparently, the apparently they look happy. They have a palace, they have all kinds of stuff available to them. But when they close their eyes before going to sleep, what must be going to their heart? 
all hell let loose inside their heart. And if good people are complaining of, of their suffering, then they are not good people. They are greedy people. They want to transact, oh I did good things, I must have hundred times return on my punya, on my good karmas. Because you, you, what do you do? You break a nariel or a coconut in front of the murti and expect a big victory in election, for example. Is this a transaction? Or is this not a transaction? And corruption starts with our own worship. What do you mean by that? When people... I give you coconut card. I give you one lakh. Give me ten lakh worth of approval. You started bribing gods. You throw some prasad, you throw some coconut, you throw some gold. Does Murti take it? No. But in the heart of your heart, you were saying, Oh, I have given so much. I expect so much. So our whole approach to God is topsy-turvy, full of corruption and greed. Yeah, we don't pray for prayer's sake, we pray for a reward. Say. Yeah. What do we get out of it? Yeah, you, you seem like you're extremely well read because in the book, for every belief, at least for most of the beliefs that you espouse about parenting or families, there's a study following, yes. you know, and I was uh, mentioning to a few people early today that usually when you read some, a book from someone who is a spiritual uh, leader of some sorts, if I were to say this, they believe that their word alone is enough. And from here, I'm just wondering, what does your reading list typically look like? Are you reading lots of books? Have you read lots of books all your life? Are you found reading scientific papers? Because it's certainly cited full of that. I propose studies also, many scientific studies, how it all works out. And I have a deep interest in all these subjects, you see. Why, for example, when your mother says, don't pluck tulsi uh, after the sunset, tulsi leaves are forbidden to be plucked. Or certain foods like white muli or white radish are not supposed to be eaten after the noon. <clears throat> there is also a great scientific study about the whole thing because of the... <clears throat> when you pluck tulsi, the chemical that is there, active chemical, it isomerizes into another thing, which is not good for your system. It has nothing to do with God. It has nothing to do with Papam. But by bringing in religion into it, common person will refrain from plucking it and save himself from side effects of Tulsi. So, everything that we try to study and proclaim, we got to have a study. No, have I read everything? No. But when we say uh, that malnourishment during pregnancy causes deformities, are thousands of articles, effect of malnutrition on mothers to be and the fetus, you'll find them. So we have to do a lot of research that way. So uh, not all the papers are because of my previous reading, but the belief that I share Based on that, we do the research and then bring it in to the question. Are there any top five, six books that you've read recently that that you enjoyed that you would like to share with people? My most favorite these these days, last two three months, has been Inner Life by a master, Sufi master called um, Hazrat Inayat Khan. Okay. One of the finest work. 
Is he from the subcontinent? Is he from somewhere else? Hazrat Inayat Khan was born in Mumbai, uh, in Baroda. Okay. Sometime uh, around 1800 something, and passed on before 1930. He was the man who took Sufism to Western Western world. Hmm. And he, didn't Sufism come from the West to India? The Sufism was actually born in India went to Middle East and then again is making rounds around the globe. I, I actually spoke to a Sufi scholar a few months ago and she said that it traveled from uh, Syria and Egypt and... and it is places. true in that sense. Uh, the recordable instances are that, that, that part of the world. But the, the essence of Sufism lies again like all the religions have the roots in India. Everything, everything that is finest that is you are seeing in the world has its origin in India. So one book is Hazrat Dayat Khan's inner life, what else? On Vivekananda, the warrior saint. Another book I enjoy reading any time like is uh, Osho's on mystical life. Have you heard his uh, lectures in Hindi? Uh, now and then, yes. I've always found, at least for me, Osho as a book versus Osho as a speaker in Hindi just worlds apart. His Hindi, I mean, is unparalleled. If anyone wants to learn Hindi and become master of Hindi, they should listen to his talks, read his Hindi books. You can really become a Hindi scholar without going to university. Oh. He was an exceptional personality, misunderstood personality. Much ahead of time that he came into this world. What else? Any other book? Uh, so many. I'm not able. I read two, three books in one go. <laughs> oh, you, Morning you in the uh, because I, I get bored of reading one and and then I get another. I keep jumping. People read it for me though. <laughs> what is it? Do they read it out to you? Read it out to me. Interesting. And then go to sleep while they're reading. Interesting. So we cover everything in one go. What's like a cool uh, thing that people don't know about you? Like, do you listen to podcasts? Something like that? I would love to, but I don't have time. <laughs> I really don't have time. I see. Well, I don't even have time to watch movies or news, even listen to news. <laughs> I'm sure you watched some movies because you mentioned uh, what, Mission Impossible 4. In well, a book. long time back. <laughs> and also, I recently I was immersed in Good Doctor, that uh, TV series. Right, it was it was wonderful. But then it, uh, then there was another one before that. So something that goes on for half hour is okay for me. More than that, <laughs> yeah, you don't binge. Uh -huh. binge much. Cool. Anyway, Daji, thank you so much for uh, doing this. Thank you so much for giving me your time and asking, answering all my selfish questions. You asked all the questions you wanted. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> it Thanks has so been much. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you.